Very nice. with that a little bit. Uh, can you hear me? Please confirm whether or not you can hear me. If you cannot, I will make some modifications. Um, okay, mic is off. So let's try this. Okay, we're going to play around with some other sound options, everybody. Um, how is this? You can hear me. Can you hear when I do this? Hear me. Can you still hear me? Am I coming through? Let's see. Um, am I okay? Okay, good, good, good. Sorry about the issues. I'm going to have to replace that extension, that mic extension, I guess. Uh, that's probably just what's going on. Well, I wanted to show you... Uh, so my mic is, is apparently not the issue, it's the mic extension. That's good to know. We've narrowed it down. Um, Ken Malinsky and Chuck Columbia in the house. Nice. Excellent. So, you may have seen my live stream on my silk moths. Here's a cocoon of a silk moth from a while ago. Uh, it's probably getting close to time for this one to eat close. Hey, critters and more. Welcome. Uh, I've got quite a few of these, and I've had, I think, five of them. Five of them hatch? One of them hatched today. So they're doing their thing, which is pretty cool. Uh, I've been trying to give them uh, pieces of rolled up paper towel for them to uh, e-close in. And now you can see, I think this is a male. It's a little harder to tell until I get closer up to it. But I believe that is a male in here that just e-closed today from that cocoon you can see behind it. Um, so there's just one, one uh, moth per cocoon, because this is not an egg case, rather, but a cocoon. Their eggs are not laid in cases. They produce their eggs just, they lay them on whatever substrate they happen to be on. So, yeah, they don't live terribly long. They don't actually even eat or anything as adults, which is kind of sad. But they're pretty cool. And, I, you know, I've got a ton of these cocoons. Let me see. Here's another one. They don't always, lay, uh, you know, build the cocoon right inside the tube. Most of them did, but some of them didn't, but that actually makes it easier for you to see it. Uh, a cool thing about the cocoons, they get the, here's a patch of silk. Now this is fantastic. This one's a little dirty. There's like a little frass or something in it. Maybe that's a little food, but this is the cool thing about the silk. You twist it and you can imagine, I mean, I'm not going to make clothing out of it or anything, but you can see I'm pulling on this really tightly. It, it's pretty strong. It's kind of fun stuff. And now I'm going to show you some moths. These are the a few of the silk moths that have e-closed and been mating. Right here. Let's take a look. This uh, one on the left here, near the top, this is a male. And then the one on the left down here is a female, and the one on the right is a male. And they've been mating non-stop since I put the female in. So, like someone was saying, they don't live very long as adults. They, they mate for a few days, they lay eggs, and that's it. They pass on. Uh, but they're pretty cool. Pretty cool little creatures. Um, and I kid you not, once the female had e-closed, I tried to put her down in the deli cup with the males, and before I even had a chance to put her down, one of the males had climbed up my finger and had started mating with the female. So, it was kind of funny. Um, I didn't even have a chance to put her down. Uh, so they're, they, you know, going about their biological imperatives and reproducing. So what I'm hoping to do is get some eggs here. Now, if any of you are curious about where I got these, I think I've mentioned it in a couple of videos before, but I got these from Susan, 
at Beast Mode Silks. She's on Instagram, she's on Facebook, and uh, you uh, can contact her if you'd like to get some some silkworms and get started. I got them when they were really tiny. She sent me, I'm not sure exact the exact number of them, but a large quantity of them, uh, along with enough food to last for several weeks, and I've been keeping them ever since. It's been really fun. They were probably, most of them were probably like a third to a half an inch long when I first got them, something like that. And they grow until they're about three inches long or so, maybe a little longer than that, and then they turn into moths. So it's kind of funny. Uh, kind of fun, not funny. Kind of fun to watch the process, watch them grow, do their thing. And I'm hoping to get some eggs. Apparently you have to uh, allow the eggs to go into a state of diapause. You have to cool them. Kind of like brumation. And uh, then you can hatch them out. So I'm looking forward to that whole process. I'm hoping that this moth will crawl out of this tube that I showed you a minute ago uh, eventually so I can put it in but uh, let's see Reyes hi and Rodolfo how long do they live the adults just a few days the uh, the larvae live a couple months I guess and the eggs can live in uh, up to mm, I guess several months cold but uh, then they hatch when you warm them up and Zachary, yeah, yeah, you, you made it in time. We've got lots of time, actually. Uh, and so that's that's just kind of the update on my, my silkworms. The moths are very cool. I'm excited to be working with them and hoping that this female, the one in the middle, is going to be laying soon. Looks like I kind of need to clean out their deli cup. I didn't expect them to produce so much mm, waste, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that is. But they don't eat when they're adults. Uh, presumably they still produce some waste because there's something going on in there. This is all kind of new to me. My first silk moths have shown up in the past couple of weeks from my caterpillars. Um, let's see. <laughs> Being a larvae film nostalgic. like it. I like it. Um, so does anybody have any requests of what you want to see? I'll honor it if I can, if it's practical for me to do so. Um, Heather Jensen, I would say, have you tried uh, bean beetles? Bean beetles are, are pretty uh, pretty awesome for something that size, I would say. I mean, I don't know. Uh, that's the first thing that comes to my mind would be bean beetles. They're pretty easy to culture too. I used to culture bean beetles. They're one of the easiest live foods you can possibly culture, in fact, because you just throw them in with dry beans in a ventilated container. End of story. A few weeks later, you have bean beetles. And you just keep doing that. So, and I, I used to give them to my dart frogs. And so, Rodolfo, yes, the, the worms make the silk, and then the moths uh, do not. They just make babies. And Newt, I do not have any mantises at the moment. Um, our orchid mantis passed away not all that long ago, and that was sad. But it's normal, you know. They don't live all that long once they become an adult, and she became an adult pretty soon after we got her. So, and it's been, it's been quite a while but she did um, pass away. So, let's see. Okay, we're getting some requests for beetles, some requests for Hoffman's egg eye, milkbacks, these are milkbacks here. Chuck, yes, indeed. Ah, so ravenous, you need larger feeder items. Oh, okay, larger feeder items, beetle-wise. I guess you could look at peanut beetle larvae. Um, so, Ken, you want to see some Hoffman's egg eye? Let me pull some out. If I can find some, I have some black Hoffman's egg eye and I have the normals and probably some chocolates. Um, and I will be right back. I'm going to have to take off my mic extension because, I mean my mic because, you know, my mic extension broke apparently. 
I have another one. I'll try it, but I can't go get it right now. So just a second. Okay, I'm, I'm getting some Hoffman's egg eye uh, out here. Well, let's let's see what we got under this. This this enclosure is pretty recent. I moved some of my uh, milk bags into this enclosure. Oh, look at all those springtails on there. Oh, it's not fitting in the shot very well, but there's a ton of springtails under it. There's not that many uh, milk bags in here because I just moved some in. There's actually kind of a lot under the, the magnolia pod though. You can see them around, messing around in the corner over there. And there's a bunch on this magnolia pod. But there's really not all that many in this enclosure because it was, you know, I just moved them in here a couple months ago maybe. And I didn't move all of them in, I just put some of them in. They're doing well, it's just, it's, you know, the colony's not as old as it might be. Uh, okay. Let's see if we could, maybe we could do the Lukes. The problem is I'm not in the room with the Lukes, but we'll see what we can do. Let's see, I'm trying to find, if I, I don't have any mature Hoffman's egg eye, completely adult mature Hoffman's egg eye right now, uh, like mature size. I do have breeding individuals, but let's, let's just, I'm pulling a couple out of the container here. I've got some babies too. Um, let's take a look at some. Okay, here is one of my larger males, which is, you know, not an adult in terms of full sizeness, but it's putting on some size. There, uh, a female right next to it, right in the middle of the screen. We got the male and a female, and then a couple of juveniles there. Let's look at here. We've got there's some younger ones. And smaller ones, not tiny, tiny babies, but pretty small. So Armadillidium vulgar, you lost one. Oh, I'm going to put this down before they jump out. Um, you lost one of your Armadillidium vulgar, a wild one. That's not abnormal. It could be you're doing everything fine, just fine. But that's not something that, uh, you know, a wild one, especially if it was mature size, it could just be dying partly. I mean, you know, you got to think of several options. It could be that it's just, it's old. That, that very well could have happened and it's no fault of yours. It could also be that uh, there, there's often die off with wild caught populations initially. At least I've seen that. As they're adapting, not all of them adapt all that well to warmer temperatures and different things. So there, there's some of that that could be going on too. And if it is too moist, um, that could be a, a problem as well. Okay. Chris Biggs has some white Hoffman's egg eye. That's awesome. You know, my favorites are that I've seen so far are the orange. I've only seen photos of them, but dang, I would like to get some of those. Like Magnificus, but, but not Magnificus, but just as cool, you know? Let's see if we can keep see a couple of duckies in here. Because Ken asked to see the duckies. Let's see. Some springtails on this piece of wood. But they don't tend to hang out on the cork bark all that much. They tend to prefer their limestone bits. So let's see what we got. Ooh, duckies. Look at those duckies. Try to focus on the duckies. There should be some baby duckies in in there if I can maneuver this to try to look inside there. It's hard to get into the little crevices and see what's going on. But I think I might see a baby or two down there. Hmm. I should probably put my reading glasses on to see what I can see. What substrate ratio do I use for the rubber duckies? Um, just about the same as I do for everybody else. 
approximately one third compost, one third leaf litter. Oh, there's a big ducky right there. Look at that big old ducky. Um, and one third, uh, well, I probably do a little lighter than one third of the wood, but something like that. They, they are pretty rich and dark. These come from both Dan Vivas at uh, Mitten Exotics and from Damien at uh, Nocturnal Exotics. Two different sources. And let's see. Those are all the duckies that I'm seeing right now. Hopefully there's some babies running around because I've seen quite a number of babies. The last time I looked in here I saw babies, so hopefully they're still older babies too, not just tiny little newly born ones. Going to moisten the moss a little bit. These are not a species you want to dry out for sure. And so the limestone, yeah, I do put the limestone in there, but I don't mix it with the substrate necessarily. I sometimes mix eggshell, crust eggshell with the substrate or cuddle bone. But uh, yeah, let's go look at the red tigers then. I do have red tigers um, and that's all I do have. That is all for the Q-Virus, as I saw somebody said. That is true. The reasoning behind that is that I do not have a permit to sell a Q-Virus at this point. And uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, spend a ton of money getting Q-Virus that I can't sell. Because so I think somebody asked, do I sell stuff that I keep? Yes, I do sell isopods a lot um, shipped out quite a number of them today and oh there's a bunch of red tigers I just had to find some you can see some little ones in there a couple of different sizes nice I'm glad you got a decent look at these before they ran away um, okay and they're gonna run off because that's what red tigers do Um, my favorite Armadillidium vulgari morph is, well, like straight morph-wise, um, I really like Punta Cana a lot, which is more of a locality than a morph, I guess. Um, I'm just looking over here to see what I got. They're all pretty fantastic. Um, as far as a, a type that I'm really having fun having Armadillidium vulgari gem mix, uh, Magic Potion is up there. It's a really cool one. So... Hard to pick one, really. And I'm sorry, you're losing all the the red tigers. There's this lone little juvenile. Let's look at these one more time. As I, I'm going to turn this around so you can see that. J-Man's in the house. Welcome. And checking out the... Yeah, my red tigers bred a lot sooner then my red, my rubber duckies, and there's, there's a lot of babies in here from what I have seen. I'm going to just dig a little bit, not dig, but you know, push some substrate out of the way. I'm seeing babies as I move things around. Um, I just put them in this, this new substrate. Let me check the date. Um, October 20th, I changed the substrate. Um, so they're, they're fairly new in here, but I'm just, yep, I see, there's one. Little guy, little baby. Uh, I can't really get him out of the substrate. Um, and the amount of limestone for duckies matter. I think the most important thing is they have some limestone chunks that they can hang around on and enough so that a lot of them hang on it, uh, hang around on it, I guess. That, that seems to be important. But I don't know that the exact quantity is something I could figure out. What other Cubaris would you get if you could? I love Jupiter and I love the lemon blue. Probably the spikies. Those would be neat. I, I would do something like that. Um, let's see. Oh, and there's Richard from the Tarantula Collective. Awesome. So if you haven't seen it yet, everyone, I posted on 
uh, I think I reposted on Instagram and I posted on my community page on YouTube and I put it on Patreon for those of you who are Patreon, uh, patrons, a video that the Tarantula Collective did of an unboxing of some of the, the Armadillidium clue guide that I sent him. He has this awesome macro lens and I have never seen clue guy like that. It's like, it's an amazing experience. So check it out. It's so cool. Uh, I love it. So, okay, I'm going to put these guys away now. Oh, sorry, silkworms. Bumped the silkworms. Got everything stacked up over here. Um, so you should check it out if you haven't seen it. It is like seeing something for the first time. And you're welcome, Richard. I'm glad, glad you're enjoying those. Um, let's see. Checking things out here. Trying to catch up on the, the chat. Clue guy going crazy for the runner beans. Nice. What do ice hub pods do when the temperature drops? How do they survive the winter? A lot of them are in places like underground, you know, under cover and go into a, essentially a hibernation state. It does depend on where they live because there are ice pods that live where that's not necessary. But that's what they tend to do when it is cold. Okay. Um, I was speaking of My Punta Cana, so I'm going to show you a few of them and see how they're doing. I love this morph because of the variety in the tone, the kind of metallic coppery nature in some of them, and then the normal coloration in others. It's kind of cool. Let's see. And isopods eat other insects. Yeah, if you put dead mealworms or crickets or something in here, they will eat them. Uh, they will generally not eat other living in eat living insects. They're not insects themselves, of course. They're crustaceans. But they will generally not eat living insects, but there could be exceptions, uh, especially if it's damaged. If it's damaged, they'll go after it. And if it's dead, they'll definitely go after it in most cases. Smoky oaks. I haven't kept smoky oaks, Heather. I'm not sure. Anybody else know that? So Nizagaster, you're in the house. I have a question, an answer for your question. He sent a question earlier. Nizogaster did. So this is for you. It says, I have a question about keeping millipedes. What would you say is the best container for three, four to five inch millipedes? So you got three millipedes in, that are about four to five inches long. Currently keep a single millipede in a smallish container, even though my area is teeming with millipedes because space is currently an issue for me. I thought about the Isoviva display cases but I'm not sure if it's big enough for my needs. Also, most sterilite containers I find tend to be much too big for my current space limitation. Any thoughts would be great. Well, if the millipedes are three, are four to five inches long and you just have three of them and you're not planning on getting a whole lot more of them or breeding them, or if you are breeding them, you're, you're able to home, rehome the babies when they're small, I would say an Isoviva bin would be perfectly adequate for three, um, especially if they're not a super girthy species. Like if you're doing ivories in there, and you have enough substrate in there, so it's about as deep as they are tall, as they are long, then yeah, I would go with it. Uh, I think you would be fine, and I would also say don't have, uh, don't worry too much about a lot of ventilation. Maybe get one of the containers that has less ventilation, because the, all of them have sufficient ventilation, even the ones that have the least, have enough, in my opinion, for most millipedes. Um, so let's see. The paperclip colony. <laughs> uh, let's see. Looks like I'm glad that a lot of people have checked out Richard's um, video with the, the macro lens because that was so cool. I loved it. I want to show you. Ooh. Sorry. My Punta Canas are hiding now. The other day I redid their substrate and there were so many in here. It was crazy. So many tinies. Um, and okay. So Newt, if two Punta Canas are the same color breed, will they make other Punta Cana colors? That's my understanding. It's like a polymorphic 
thing going on here that they'll they'll produce lots of different ones even if you start out with uh, two you're not sure what you're going to get so I think that that uh, that's how that works in my understanding and And those were, in fact, Punta Canas. They were not Luce, Santa Lucia's, but I could see why you'd say so, because they're so similar. Uh, very similar indeed, those two varieties, or localities, I should say. These are my Cali mix, California mix. And there are lots of babies in here, and I love the polymorphism going on in here. Speaking of polymorphic isopods, they're Porcelli labus, one locality, and... They produce all different colors. So there's some wild type ones. Some of the adults are wild types. Ooh, some of the adults are kind of a peachy, orangey color. Some look kind of like milk backs. And the babies are all coming in all different uh, forms. So some of them are just white and stay white their whole lives, which is cool. So I'm finding this, uh, this locality really fun because there's so much variety. I've realized something about myself and that's I like the the variable localities like Punta Cana's and California mix and I like the mixes the morph mix like lottery mix or party mix or uh, you know any of the others that are just gem mix that kind of idea I love that. So that's that's something I like about these guys. I don't see the rust colony with the baby rust individuals running around. <laughs> um, I did post my family on Instagram on, uh, I think it was on Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was on actual Thanksgiving on my Instagram. And it ended up on Facebook and Twitter too because they, they go that way. Cloud 9.5 started some local, local scavers. Nice. But speaking of those, I want to check my, my recent... Um, scavers here, just a second, my lavas. The lavas have only had a week or two. Really want to see how they're doing. And um, Cloud 9.5, I want to do a live stream for the Lukes. I totally get what you're saying. We need to do one. I want to do a live feeding of the Lukes, my, my dart frogs. I just, I can't really do it now because I would have to move the camera to the other room. And that would be rather difficult. So, Reyes, the Tylobolus uncigerus. I have not kept that species, so I'm not sure what to tell you on that. Hopefully their care is pretty similar to other millipedes. Let's check out these lavas and see how they're doing. Look at that. I love the... Uh, the markings and the contrast on these, they're like, it's like Calico's Plus. Love these guys. So if you haven't seen the, the unboxing video on these, I used my macro lens. It's not as cool as Richard's macro lens, but it still gives you a pretty good look at these guys. Um, so they're, they're very cool. I love the variety. In them and apparently they're a it's a co-dominant trait which is awesome I'm not seeing any monka yet but I don't think it'll be too long because Porcelio Scaber usually doesn't take too long before you get some and so it, cloud 9.5 you start mixing eggshells into the substrate with isopods cut themselves or get injured I don't think so uh, in general as long as you're not mixing them, you know, if you're mixing them really roughly when the isopods are actually in the soil, that could happen. Uh, when I give isopods um, the, the eggshells, I just put them on top of something and they'll come and eat them. So that works. And I see what you mean, Heather. There's, there's a resemblance between these and Sylvestri. That totally makes sense. And thank you, Barb. <laughs> Newt, I love it. I love it. Well, cork bark can handle pretty high temperatures, not too surprisingly, but this is special lava-proof plastic. I, you know, Sterilite makes a lava-proof plastic, 
And you know, you can get the other ones at the dollar store, but this particular uh, bin, you can't get it at the dollar store because it's lava proof. But if you want to know um, how to get a hold of one of the lava proof bins, I, I got a guy. So just, you know, hit me up on Instagram or something like that. And I, I can tell you where to get the, the lava proof bins. But just don't touch these guys with your bare hands. Because, you know, that's, that's not a party. So bat guano, yeah, I was talking to someone about that. Oh, there you go, Heather Jensen. That makes sense. Oh, critters and more. You got a natural lava show up. That's awesome. Mm, okay. <laughs> Muy caliente. <laughs> okay. What are we looking at over here? Oh, we've got some other milk bags. Just trying to see what I have available that I can reach. Yeah, the milk bags are fun. They are seriously so underrated. I don't know why more people don't have milk bags. I've got three bins with milk bags in them. This is one of them right here. I wonder if they'll come out and have some fun. Maybe they want to eat. Uh, that's a funny, silly question. Of course they want to eat. Let's see if they're going to go after those pellets. How long does it take before the first one finds the pellets? Oh, that one's not hungry, apparently. That's, that's too bad. Yeah, the new, the new colonies do take a long time. But I guess you guys have seen my video on that, hopefully. The new colonies, how they seem like ghost towns for a while. It is true. Milkback prices have increased? That's kind of weird. I wonder why, because they're so easy to breed. They breed just almost like dairy cows, and they're, they are very like dairy cows. Somebody said that a minute ago. A lot like dairy cows in their activity levels and their ability to, or their, they're not very scared of the light. As you can see, these are under a bright LED light, and they don't seem to care at all. I'm loving these guys. So, I do have a maculatum. You have any Dalmatian Montenegros? I do not. I just have two localities of Montenegro. Or two localities, that doesn't make sense. Two localities of Armadillidium klugai. I've got the Montenegro normals, and I've got the Montenegro, or, and I've got the klugai uh, Dubrovnik red face. That's all. And Ken, I think you're right. Isopirate. I'll go with that. That works well. Mardi Gras? Nope. I only have Oniscus acellus wild type and Oniscus uh, BC maple are the two morphs that I have. I recently found um, some juveniles in the BC maple. So, and I've been breeding the Oniscus cells for years, the wild types. Yeah, there's a few in here that are all, almost all white. I think I just saw one up in the top. Look at that one at the top. That one is uh, right there, you know, almost. Maybe it is all white. That's an interesting thing going on. I've never seen that before. Um, I used to have the pudding, but I actually gave them away. So BC Maple is the orange morph of Oniscus acellus. And Heather Jensen, I gave them away as part of a trade because um, I personally wasn't too into the puddings. I didn't find them... I feel like there's less color than there was with the original, and I usually don't like that. I'm getting some Hoffman's Egg Eye Black. Just going to take a peek at those in a minute here. And I also got my um, Dubrovnik Red Phases. So I'm going to show everybody that in a minute. So, and Chuck, oh, I'm totally up. I'm totally up for that. That would work. We can, we can do a trade. Because Mardi Gras are awesome and I don't have any, which is kind of weird. Since I can ship those, I should have them, All right? So, let's do a trade. Critters and more. Found your first BC Maple Monkai today. Awesome. And Evie Hankins. Do you find shy species get more bold once they have numbers in their enclosure? 
almost invariably yeah i mean it's especially true for bold species like this one the milkbacks and dairy cows and zebras and powders and some others um porcelli ornatus uh for example that are really really bold when they have numbers but even species that are not as bold are still much more bold when there are numbers in the enclosures almost invariably and and these are milk backs yep these are milk backs they have a very strange pattern but um, milk backs have quite a bit of variety to them and so you'll get milk backs that have just the the pale center like there's the one almost right on top of the the food pellet right there now that's like a classic milk back pattern but then there's others that it, they throw that look almost like milk uh, like dairy cows and reyes can peds be housed with pods well i will tell you that i prefer not to do that i think it is uh a bit risky i think some people can do it successfully and i've heard of people doing it successfully for a long time i choose not to because i think it is a little dangerous uh, just because you know most of the time isopods won't bug things that are molting if there are aren't any problems but let's say a millipede gets a couple of has a, a slight mismolt not enough to kill it but enough to cause some cosmetic damage and so isopods might go after that and the millipede might otherwise have survived that and then molted you know a few more times and corrected the cosmetic damages you know things like that could happen so I choose not to do it. I found trichorhinotomentosa in with my bumblebee millipedes once, redid the substrate entirely so that they were gone. I found mil not milkbacks, dairy cows in with my orthoporus that somehow got in there and tried to take them all out because that's not what I want to do. I, I just prefer to keep them separately. I know some people can do it, but I don't know that I want to risk that. I just think it is a risk. Sometimes maybe a small risk, depending on species you're mixing and different things, but I think it's always some kind of risk. Um, and Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, any plans of an isopod collection tour? I need to do another one. I do. Totally do. And actually, yes, there is one in the early planning stages. Um, I don't want to tell too much, but it, it may involve another, it may involve a collaboration. So, uh, kind of working on that. Yes, there is an iron in the fire. And, and I'll tell you, Evie, that clowns are one of the shyer ones. They do tend to come out more at night. But I don't see my clowns much unless I flip over the, the cork bark. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so us some random ones and see if you can name it. Oh, I love it. Let's do it. Name that isopod. I'm going to do that. So, JH, your millipedes would try to get away from the isopods. I do find that interesting. Okay, I'm going to show you a species and see what you think, okay? Here we go. I'm going to go pull a species, not tell you what it is. You figure it out. First one to figure it out and post it as a comment wins uh, an accolade. Everybody says yay. That's that's about all. So I can't really offer you anything better than that. Did I just turn off the light? I did. Sorry. I'll fix it before we get too much further here. There. Plugged it back in. Okay. Now, here we go. We're going to figure out what isopods these guys are. Ooh, they need some more moss. What are these guys? Who's got it? Yes, powder oranges EV are very much less shy. One of the... Okay, theropods was the first one that I saw. 
uh, to, to say what they were. Thoropods, you got it. These are curlies, otherwise known as teardrop isopods, and scientifically Silisticus convexus. So very good. All right, they do look a lot like Lavis. Their, their gloss is very similar. But these guys roll up. Check it out. They roll up. They don't stay rolled up for long, and when they do, it's not a complete circle. But there's a tiny little one in between my fingers there. It just fell down. They don't stay rolled up for very long at all, but they do roll up. Just cool. These guys are practically bulletproof. They're not particular about ventilation. Um, and they make a decent cleanup crew isopod, but probably not uh, probably not one that people talk about a lot. But they should. They should. Because it's it's pretty cool isopod and like I said, decent cleanup crew. I put it in with my oh, a crested gecko that I have, one of our crested geckos, and it seems to work. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do need to rename the, uh, the stream. I, I think we should play Guess the Ice Pot some other time, too. Okay. So, making sure I don't have any Silisticus Convex is still on my hands. And let's take a peek at these. Guess that isopod. Who's got it? Yep, Heather was the first one with it, at least that showed up on my side. These are Hoffman's Egg Eye, but which locality? Black, yep, they're black Hoffman's Egg Eye. Ooh, it looks like there's some slime mold in there. I'm gonna have to get that. And the one on the left is Dave, how did you know? Let's see. I'm going to try to pick a species that's a little trickier. Hmm. And then maybe I'll do another. I do think slime mold is pretty interesting. I just uh, want to make sure it's not out of control. Okay. Name that isopod species. And there we go. What is this one? Oh, Newt, you got it. Florida fast. Nice job, Newt. Florida fast. And they are very much due for leaves. They go through them so fast. Um, pardon me, I do not like to see my uh, isopods bereft of leaves like this, so I'm going to be back in just a second with a new handful of leaves for him. Some of your favorite leaves, Newt. These are the leaves that you like. Hey, I love your idea. Heather, we should do that. Do that at a reptile expo. And have maybe a screen that's uh, showing everybody the isopods that you're showing, just like behind you on a large screen so everybody gets an equal shot at it. These are Newt's favorite leaves. Um, they're a mixture of leaves that I collect in my backyard. And there's there's a tree called the Goldenwood tree in here. This is, I think it's a branch from our curly willow. There's willow, there's pecan, there's uh, calorie pear, there's maple in here. There's, they're a mix. So, there's that isopod. Uh, that's an underrated isopod for cleaning too, and they, they do well in, in moist habitats. So, oh, Beetle King, awesome. No, oh, congratulations with that uh, impending pupation. That's very cool. And... I'm going to check this one out and see here. Okay, who can name these the fastest? Locality included, okay? I guess that's a hint. Locality included. They're a type of clown, but which type? They're not actually Montenegro. 
So Newt's the closest so far. Thoropods, that's, yeah, that's... And what's the locality? The name of the location? The ge Okay, Beetle King. Although the spelling probably got autocorrected. Yeah, it's Dubrovnik red face. So it was kind of a collaborative effort. Several of you kind of got there. This is Dubrovnik red phase. Yep. So Armadillidium klugai, same species as Montenegro, different location. These are Croatian uh, locality. And then within that Croatian locality, these are the redder ones. There are some that are entirely red. You can see these are pretty red already. Um, but they do throw some that are just basically all red with white spots. Apparently they don't throw the yellow, they don't throw individuals with yellow spots like Montenegro does. So, yeah, their skirt is crazy. And this is the species that, oh yep, Ken, you got the perfect spelling there. First one to get the correct spelling entirely. Um, these I got at the, the Reptile Expo back in the beginning of October. So I'm definitely going to be breeding these. I haven't seen any monkey or any juveniles of any kind yet. But they are gorgeous, in my opinion. And I uh, really wanted to get a hold of some of these and found there's someone who lives about an hour away from me that was breeding them. So um, the good bug on, on uh, what's it called, eBay, had these. And I also got my Cali Mix um, Porcelio Levis and my Oreo Crumbles. Porcelionides prunosus from them, and some of my uh, Porcelio ornatus, yellow, high yellow, from them when I was at the expo. Um, just did like kind of a big order, uh, and Heather, who's in the stream, and J-Man, who's in the stream, both uh, got some from that particular order. And... So, Evie, my guess is that they could live together, but it would probably be an issue in that they would probably interbreed and screw up the bloodlines a bit. So I wouldn't recommend keeping them together, even though I think they could survive. It would probably cause some issues. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, ha, ha, ha. This one's going to be an easy one, but I'm going to do it anyway because... I love this species. You ready for this? Okay, there's the next species in the game. Boom, let's do it. Who's got it? Now, Newt, you're totally right that Dairy Cow is one of my favorites. And what's up, Xander? Uh, good night. Oh, you're going to bed? Okay. Good night. Good Love night. you. Okay. So who got it first? Let's see. Okay, Newt had the right type. The spelling a little bit off, but let's see. Yep. Uh, Heather got the spelling all right, so cool. So Therapod Hunter to tell the difference between Granulatum and Gestroy. Okay. Granulatum seemed to get a little bigger. Gestroy are very more, very much more glossy and the markings are much more vivid. Granulatum is like a, kind of a dull gesture almost. So hopefully that helps. That's the easiest way to tell. So are we back in focus now? Huh. So are we out of focus? I, it looks like it's in focus on this side, so... Huh. I, is it something going wrong? Is everybody seeing it out of focus? Huh. I even have my reading glasses on to make sure it's in focus, but... And Nicholas, I do have a video on my channel of breeding fruit flies. It's old, but it still works. I've made some tweaks to the medium since then, but it's still a perfectly good video and it works just fine. So thanks for joining in, Armadillidium vulgari. Huh, Ken, you're lagging about four seconds behind the questions? Okay, that's not too bad for lag. So I'm, huh, okay. Interesting. So these guys are, have produced so many babies for me. I love these. 
if you look in the substrate, you can see they're all over in the substrate too. They're under the moss. They're everywhere. You dig over here. See, they're just everywhere. They're all over this entire enclosure. It's pretty cool. They make me happy. I love these guys. Oh, Nicholas, good. You watched the cricket one. Nice. The cricket one is old too, but it still works. Oh, congrats on the babies, Chuck Columbia Magic Potions. I'm still waiting for mine. Uh, I haven't had mine all that long, but long enough that I'm starting to look for babies and have not seen any yet. Let's see. I'm trying to see if I have a container of ice pods I can actually fit over there. Okay. Uh, okay, I got this one. The potions I only got in October, I think. So it hasn't been that long. Um, so hopefully they'll be breeding soon. This one's going to be easy to figure out. Huh, sorry to hear about that, Heather. Losing some of your potions. And thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Who's got this species? I know this is a super easy one, but hey, it's fun. Ornatus, yep. Porcelli Ornatus High Yellow. Mm hmm. Cool. Very good. I think Newt was the first one to get there. I think. Let's see. I was looking in here and seeing juveniles before, and I know there are juveniles in here. I just wanted to see if we could spot a couple, because that's always fun. Not a single one under that piece, huh? Okay, well, I'm going to lift up this little piece of wood here and see what we get. Oh, there's a baby. It's not a manka because it's too big to be a manka now. They, oh, there's more babies down in the substrate, but they're out of focus in the background. But yeah, we've got some. They're pretty big. An interesting thing about Ornatus is they, they start big. The babies start pretty big. And so it's kind of... Um, fascinating that they come out so big and that the parents seem to take care of them for quite a while. The parents hung out with the babies for several days. Biggest armadillidium species? I know I don't have it. I know there are several species that people talk about being the biggest. Granulatum is big. Um, Officionalis is big, but I'm not sure what the biggest one is. Taxicab isopods, I can see that. Okay, I'm going to put these guys back and see what else I can get. So, Killcast. Anazotum is a great species. That is totally underrated, in my opinion. They're very cool. Um, and very adaptable. More adaptable than uh, maybe people would suspect. Okay, I think... We've got time for a couple more species. I'll be right back. You should see my room after I do this live stream. It's just isopod bins everywhere. It takes me days to clean it up. No, not days. It takes a while, though. Uh, okay. Who's got this one? Whoa, there we go. And kill cast. Dairy cows are awesome. Gotta say it. One of the best starters. To, yeah, I agree. They're awesome. The only issue with them is that they have to... Uh, you have to be prepared for like crazy reproduction, but other than that, it's awesome. It's one of my favorites. Let's see. It is a mix. Real estate is right. Scaper party mix. Yep. Cloud 9.5. You got it. It is known as party mix, lottery mix, gym mix. It has several names. Uh, but this particular mix 
when I set out to produce some uh, Porcelio Scabbard orange Dalmatian back in the day before anybody really had them. Ryan Orr, the producer of them, had them. I think Alan Gross had them. Um, they were producing them. But just as they were producing them, I was too. I started right after they did. So I produced some of the first uh, orange Dalmatians. But the thing is, I kept the parents together. And so now I have this has orange Dalmatians, normal Dalmatians, oranges, wild types, calicos, and I threw in a few pides that uh, my normals produced. So there are a few pides in here, and hopefully they'll be, um, you know, adding to the gene pool, because I, I really like the pides. And since it's, you know, they my colony threw them, they're like separate genetically from any other pides, not descended from the same stock. So this is fun. But the, the pides are a fairly recent introduction, and I'm not seeing a lot of them yet. But I really like them. Um, let's see. And I probably will throw lavas in there at some point um, when I have enough. And Nicholas, you want to see some silk moths? I was showing them at the beginning of the stream, but I'm going to show just really quickly. That is a male on the left, female in the middle, and a male on the right. And I've got a couple more too. But yeah, they're, they're going to be breeding. So let's see, are you going to be separate any of those for alternate breeding projects? I don't know because I have separate colonies of orange Dalmatians, Dalmatians, uh, oranges, calicos, and so on. I might separate out some pides. We'll see. But um, so Chuck, how do you distinguish these? The females antennae are a little narrower and they have these little white doodles that show up. I, I don't know that's not a technical term, but I'm still learning a lot about these these moths. Their wings look a little bit different too, but the females are also fatter. And yeah, that's, I'm still learning though. But they seem, uh, one thing when you put them together, the you can see who the males are because they go right after the females. So I just did the Porcelia Scaber party mix or lottery mix or whatever you want to call it. Now let's do two more species and then we'll be done, I think, uh, with the live stream because I need to go edit some videos and stuff, but this is fun. <laughs> yep, yeah, don't quote me on the little white doodles. No, you just did. It's okay. It's all good. So I'm still training my kids on how to put the leaves in here and not get all over the moss. That's okay. So this species, who's got this one? Oh, look, there's a, either a manka or a very young juvenile crawling in the, uh, like the center of the screen. BC Maple, Chuck Columbia got it. Spelling autocorrect attack to you, but you got it. Okay. Yep. Chuck, you got the, the first one. It's, it's the uh, Oniscus ocellus BC Maple. And I, there are at least two different clutches of offspring in here because that one might actually be a manka or just very recently born and then there were some other larger ones in here I saw earlier so yeah they're they're doing fairly well I mean it's a new colony so you're not seeing a ton of activity in there but that's something and cool all right one more species one more here we go I think everybody's gonna get this one right away but hey it's part of the game it's fun we like it. Oh, sorry to hear that, Cody. That's not a great place to spend the Thanksgiving, is it? Who's got it? What is this? Expanses? Beetlejuice is a, is a common name. Porcelio expansis, yep. Porcelio expansis, there you go. So that was kind of a collaborative effort. Um, it looks like autocorrect attacked you, Heather, but you had the right idea. Newt was right with the species name and Killcast got the whole name, genus, and species in it. So Dragon Isopod is another common name, yep. And I've got quite a few in here. The J-Man. And Isopod Source made this happen for me. This has been a dream isopod for me. 
one of the coolest isopods. I know I just say that all the time, but they're so cool. And Dave is crawling off to the left. Ken, you have an uncanny ability to recognize Dave's. Is that like your marginally useful mutant power or something? That's, that's pretty cool, I gotta say. <laughs> Autumn Sky, that's awesome. Oh no, Cody, I hope you heal quickly. Oh, King Gizzard. Expands this orange, that's cool. I just, I have the, like the nominate morph, I guess it is, but they're so cool. Specific care for these guys, Evie. Um, yeah, they like it. Let me pull back just a wee bit here. They like a mossy patch, but you got to give them plenty of dry area on the other side. Good ventilation. I have nice ventilation on this container. And so keep one side dry. Make sure they have concave pieces of cork bark like this because they like to be off the substrate. I learned that from Wally at Supreme Gecko. And before I even had these guys, he, he taught me that. So that seems to be a key with a lot of the Spanish porcelia, the ones that need a lot of ventilation. They also like to be off the substrate. And they just started breeding like crazy once... Uh, you know, I just put them in here. I mean, it hardly took any time at all before they were breeding. Oh, dropped this little piece of... I'm just going to check and see if there are any wee babies under these, because a lot of times there are. That's not a wee baby, that's just a baby. But um, sometimes there are really small ones down there. Quite often, in fact, so I thought I'd check. But nope, no dice there. Very similar to clowns. If you keep these like clowns, you'll probably be fine. Um, they even have similar eating habits in that they don't tend to eat a lot of leaf litter. Uh, they're one of the few isopods in the hobby that doesn't really chat on a leaf litter all that much. They like fish-based things. So, uh, fish food is a big, big uh, staple for these guys. And I... I do offer them cuddle bone for limestone, or instead of limestone. I offer them cuttle bone. You could put some ground eggshell or ground limestone in the substrate, and that wouldn't hurt anything. They do seem to nibble on the cuddle bone a, li a bit. And let's see. Yeah, these are definitely one to get, Ken. I love these things. They're on my list. I can't ship these. But I can keep them. My permit allows me to keep them. And so I'm just jazzed that I can keep them. And I'm assuming someday I'll be able to amend my permit. But in the meantime, local reptile shows in the same state. I can sell them. So, um, Hello, Crystal and Nicholas. I would show you the bird, but I'd have to go hunt for him. And by the time I found him, I'm not sure if he's in his enclosure or sitting on somebody's shoulder because he spends a lot of time on people's shoulders. But... Crystal's in the house. Nice to see you here. And, well, technically, most isopods need permits to cross state lines. Uh, and that is kind of annoying. But when I ship them, I ship a permit with them. My permit number with them every time. Got to do it. So, and thank you for the like, Spike Heather. It looks like we're up to 45, which is pretty awesome. Where do I study all of this stuff? Well, uh, online mostly, I guess. So, Chuck, no. <laughs> Many of them don't have permits. I know it's kind of a controversial topic, but um, I went ahead and got my permits as soon as I could and now have permits to ship everywhere but Florida and Hawaii, every state. I can't ship out of the country. Um, so... Yeah, it's better to be safe than sorry. I guess that's how I've looked at it, and it does make a difference. So, all right. Hey, Salvo, welcome. So I just looked at the, the timer. It says we're at 64 minutes, and I guess this was our last isopod for, for Guess the Isopod. Got to go do some video editing and stuff tonight, but it's been great. I did enjoy this game, uh, the Guess the Isopod even though some of them were dead giveaways and others were a little bit more challenging. Uh, we ought to do it again. And uh, I'll answer a couple questions, then i got to go. And Newt, I'll, I'll try to do one more isopod just for you. Okay, and everybody else, for all of you. Okay, so 
snailyontologist, I'm going to answer your question, and then I'm going to go grab some more isopods, and then we'll, we'll do one more isopod, and we'll be done. So, uh, let's see. So, you don't need a permit, uh, at least a, a federal permit. You might want to check your local area, like your state and your city, your county and whatnot, for catching local isopods. But to catch anything in state, APHIS doesn't regulate um, in this intrastate movement. So within the state, they don't regulate the movement of isopods. Once you go between state lines, that's when they care. Okay, I'm going to go grab one more isopod. Okay, gotta put my expenses away. See you later, expenses. Okay, maybe you can make a guess by the fact that you can't see a single isopod on the surface of the enclosure right now. Maybe that'll give you a hint. And here we go. Okay, cloud 9.5, looks like you got it. Yep, this is Armadillidium Kluge Montenegro. Look at all those wee ones. Yep, they're beauties. They love to hide though. Like immediately, so you don't see much of them. They spend like 90% of their time just right under this piece of wood, right next to the moss that I keep damp, but they're pretty dry where they are. Um, yeah, the babies hang out. Um, yeah, Brandon, that is awesome. I'm glad that's working out for you. Did I email you back? Because I meant to, and I'm not sure I did. I get so many emails sometimes. I'm not sure if I did, but I think you emailed me about that, didn't you? Yep, you know, Cody, um, my first isopods I ever kept were actually aquatic ones. And Brandon, I will try to email you back. If you email me, I will, I will do again and just remind me. That will help me get back on track. Because sometimes, honestly, I get so swamped with emails that um, you know how that can be. So... I will try, if I can. But, okay, so Armadillidium klugai Montenegro are the last isopods in the video. Thank you everyone for joining in. I enjoyed the game, I'm glad you did too, for those of you who did. And we'll just close out with these uh, milkbacks in the background munching on fish food pellets. And everyone have a great evening, stay safe, stay healthy. Happy holidays for those of you who are celebrating.